Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the draft zoning bylaw for the Hartwell Innovation Park public meeting. We will be focusing on the draft zoning bylaw after much public discussion. And uh, my name is Daphne Politis. I am an urban planner. I'm principal of Community Circle. I also happen to be a resident of Lexington. Uh, so we have a presentation prepared for you this evening and um, also hope to have a lively discussion. Next slide, please. So the team. Carol Kowalski is the Assistant Town Manager for Development. Amanda Loomis is the Planning Director. Sandhya Ayer is the Economic Development Director. Sheila Page, Assistant Planning Director. Casey Haggerty, Economic Development Coordinator and Stella Carr, the Sustainability Director, and all are here with us tonight. Next slide, please. So the forum will be interactive. We would like you to raise your hand to speak. There is a chat function um, and we will not be doing any polls tonight. Next slide, please. So Amanda, would you like to tell us about uh, so what we're doing is kind of doing a recap, but also showing what was accomplished um, in the short time that we have been working on this project. And so at the, end, or the special town meeting of 2020 under Article 16, um, there was a citizens, citizens petition to move forward with the Hartwell um, project. In that Article 16, there were several things that were approved and are pending the Attorney General's approval. So the first one was the dimensional controls, which is in our zoning bylaw, which is the table that is shown in the middle of this slide here. Everything that was crossed out was what was previously required or allowed. And then everything in the underline was what was uh, replaced. So in terms of the minimum lot area, previously these um, parcels were a minimum of three acres, but now they can be 20,000 square feet. This allows for more flexibility and uh, reuse of some of the smaller parcels that were previously non-conforming. There is not a front setback because when we look at this zoning district, it is actually a lot of the development will be infill development, which will take place within the frontage of the existing buildings if any additional development were to take place. The other ones were the um, maximum height. And you'll see a constraints map shortly, but it is a maximum of 115 feet. Previously, it was 65 feet, but this is not allowed for all of the buildings within this district um, because there are constraints due to the Hanscom flyover, which would limit the um, heights in certain areas, but allow for it at 115 feet. Then the maps were also amended. The top one is the Lexington zoning map as it presently was prior to the adoption of Article 16. As you can see, when you're up near Bedford Street, there is a um, maroonish color. That was previously CSX or CRO. It was rezoned, as you can see in the map below, which was what was adopted at town meeting. That is now the CM district. If you go to where the jug handle is, there was previously a CD-1. That has also been relocated into the CM district. If you follow Hartwell down towards the yellow, um, which is where Hartwell Place is, you can also see that there was a CD-3, which was um, a special district. And that has been reallocated into the CM or the GC district. What these CDs are were planned development districts that had special approval at a town meeting, um, but may not no longer be relevant. Um, so that is what was approved. So the additional height slash density was previously approved at the special town meeting, in addition to the zoning map amendments that create the kind of the boundary. Um, Next slide, please. 
So this next one here is what is being worked on as part of this project. Um, there were three pillars, which were kind of setting things into different categories, which we'll look at later. But what we've been focusing on here is amending the zoning bylaw, the general bylaw, the zoning map, and the planning board regulations. To the bottom below the work efforts, that actually shows the boundary of the area and so it's not coming out as well as I would have liked it to, but the boundary is the yellow area is what is proposed for the Hartwell Innovation District. The, uh, to the kind of the north of Bedford Street, right near the jug handle, there's two parcels that are actually in an orange dotted line. That is the Boston Sport Club and the Armory. Those, are, those were not moved forward at special town meeting, but are still under consideration for a different type of zoning that would allow for a transition zone between the Hartwell Innovation Park and the single family residence um, to the north. The green is the Minuteman bike track, um, bike path. And so what we would be doing is just taking the CM and converting it into the CHP, which would be known as the HIP district, also Hartwell Innovation Park. To the right of this slide, you will see a series of boxes. So the first four boxes are what is being amended in the uh, zoning bylaw that we have to look at. The first one is the table of uses. We know we want to expand commercial uses for desi and desirable uses within this zoning district. So that is what we are proposing to do here, which will also be released at this time. Um, we are looking at increasing the ability of life sciences, technology, and other innovation um, kind of employment centers for this area with a focus on employment and commercial. Uh, residential is not moving forward at this time. That would be something we would be looking at for a 2022 annual town meeting. Dimensional table, that was actually already approved under Article 16 at the special town meeting, but we just put it in here because that would have been something that we would have had to take under um, as part of this initiative. The other one is standards. These are standards that projects have to comply with. So as we'll see in the zoning bylaw that is released, there are standards that include um, how the site is laid out, the requirements of how the fenestration occurs at the pedestrian scale, what can occur on the top of buildings, also sustainable regulate guidelines, and in addition to either trees or some type of landscaping. Then we have the permit requirements. We are looking at creating a unique process that allows for a developer to get through the process within 60 days. If they cannot comply with the requirements of the town, then it would increase the length that it would take to permit their projects. But what the town is um, obligated to do is to permit these projects with an efficient manner, as long as we get the information that we need to properly review the projects. In reviewing this, we've identified that we may need to um, amend two of the general bylaws. One of those is the tree bylaw, chapter 120. And then the other one is the stormwater management by bylaw, which is chapter 114. The zoning map, as we just discussed, would be creating the district. And then we have the planning board regulations. This is where the design guidelines that we have been working on and collecting a lot of the information. So if you don't see something that was, you know, a comment within the zoning standards within the bylaw, it is actually a very good chance that it's going to be in the design guidelines, which have to be complied with as well. But that's where more of how the project is going to feel, how it is kind of designed is more implemented. And it allows us to go into more details, but it also allows us to put imagery into that as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is a critical constraints map. As we talked about back in, I think it was our October or September meeting, we looked at all the different kinds of constraints. This area has a lot of constraints, but there is a lot of opportunity. So with those constraints, we include the Hanscom Air Force Aviation, um, which you can see right here. It goes over the Hartwell area. So as previously mentioned, although the zoning allows for 115 uh, foot buildings, 
this is actually what is going to limit the height of the buildings. So we'll see, you'll see the numbers that go like 170, 250, 240. It should be noted that just because it says 120, 250, that isn't off of the ground. That's, you have to take away what the elevation of the ground is from that. So it's from the basically sea level. The next one that we're gonna be talking about is the map on the lower bottom. This actually shows the aviation in the green, but it also shows where the floodplains are, the wetlands, and also the 25 foot wetland buffer. There's also within this easements like high tension wires. There is a gas line that runs through this area and there's other infrastructure as well. So those all put constraints on what is and isn't allowed within this district. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide here actually does an aerial of the proposed district, which is, you can see the yellow and the orange a lot better in this. So the yellow is the area that's being proposed to re be removed from the CM and put in as um, the Hartwell Innovation Park. And then, like we mentioned before, we are still looking at the 475, 459 Bedford Street. On the bottom of this slide here, as we had mentioned at the start of this project, we would be putting together a project area database. And so although the dimensional standards seem like it increases a lot of the density, we, can, we actually know that what we're seeing today as impervious area is kind of the maximum footprint that can take place. However, what was approved under Article 16 and moving forward is that there are additional limitations or um, requirements that a project must do. So if you go right across, the total area is 260 acres, which is basically 100% of the HIP. The existing footprints that is currently there now takes up about 12.26% of that area. The existing parking spaces, there's approximately 7,343 parking spaces. Um, whoops, two more slides. And so that takes up quite a bit, one more, <laughs> takes up kind of a lot of the space. Then in addition to that, you have the dry aisles. An average dry aisle is about 20 feet, give or take. Um, so that makes up 7% of the existing area. So when we look at that, there's approximately 77.4 acres of the um, land in the Hartwell Innovation Park that is currently used for development. This actually number does not include driveways, sidewalks, or other infrastructure. It only includes the existing footprint, the existing parking spaces, and the drive aisles. When we look at what was approved under Article 16, this actually includes the total building, the parking, the driveways, the sidewalks, etc. You're looking at basically a maximum of 98 acres. Um, so it is basically what you see is in an impervious area is what you would be getting moving forward. Um, next slide, please. So the other item that we have been working on, and this will be released at a later date, is the design guidelines. Um, so what this does is it really tells us how this project's gonna feel and how it is um, basically developed. So in these design guidelines, the major headers would include site plan and layout, building orientation and placement, the building height, the facade, pedestrian and amenity space, signage, material selection, sustainable design, and access and parking. So we are working with um, Lexington, our sustainability. We're working with the building department. We're working with conservation and other boards and commissions to help kind of fill these design guidelines out. So those will be released, um, I believe in a week or two. I wasn't, I'm not sure the exact timeline. Sadia has that number. But these will be released and these will be in the planning board's rules and regulations, which have to be complied with pursuant to the um, zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. And this is the other item that we've been working on as we've been talking about since September. 
we want to create a unique permitting process that assures that a project will be reviewed within 60 days. And then to do that, we actually have to do a lot of the work up front prior to them coming to the boards and commissions. So this is just a brief timeline that kind of gives an overview of what we would need to do. Staff through the development review team would be reviewing the applications to, or a potential project to see what needs to be done, makes recommendations, provide the requirements of the town and answers any questions that the developer may have. The developer would then take that information that they collected and they go and work on finalizing their form applications, their plans, their documentation. That is really on them. It may take them a week. It may take them six months um, to come back to for an actual formal submittal, but is not calculated within the 60 days because it's dependent on how quickly they can turn it around. But what we can control as staff and as a town is the application submittal review. So once they submit the application, it is our job to make sure that everything is complied with. This will be an electronic permitting system. So they will actually be submitting everything online and going through a checklist to make sure that they've attached everything, that we go through everything. And then we would schedule the development review team meeting. We would also um, start the publication, um, public notification to let people know that there's a project moving forward. And then the planning board would start their review. We would want to have it as a max of two meetings because it would be making sure that a lot of this project work was done prior to the formal submittal. Um, so this would allow for a permitting process to be efficiently reviewed within 60 days. The developer would have the ability if they found that they needed more time to request an extension of time, but that would be the only reason why we would extend it unless there was something that really came up that we wouldn't know about. Next slide, please. So I think, do I hear, Daphne, is this you? Thanks, Amanda. So before we go on, because Zoom has become such an everyday part of our lives, I forgot to read the governor's executive order. So I'll just take a moment, like, you know, commercial break <laughs> and read it. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 15, 2020 and subsequent orders imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so despite best efforts, we will post on the Town of Lexington website or through tech, uh, Lex Media an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive recording of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. So commercial break is over. <laughs> and um, just wanted to step back a moment and remember what it is that this, um, zoning, uh, the draft zoning bylaw is intending to do. So it's intended to add value to working, playing and living in Lexington by attracting and competing with other municipalities that are attracting biotech and uh, life sciences. And um, this creates a number of opportunities for the town, including providing more contemporary work environments for employees, outdoor amenities for residents, improved pedestrian and bike infrastructure, increased taxes for the town for all the things we wanna pay for, sustainable buildings that are more state of the art than the current ones, as well as improved transportation options. Next slide, please. So the town um, conducted a, a robust public engagement process and did a lot of listening. And this is what we heard. The uh, participants identified the following priorities. Make the district a place for people rather than for cars. Increase the sense of cohesiveness of the district. So it feels more like a sense of, there's more of a sense of place. And 
that it be uh, that green space and mature trees be protected and that nature paths be preserved and be a, a part of this whole place. So how will this be achieved? So the zoning requires that a pedestrian amenity area include trees, pedestrian amenities. And what does pedestrian amenities mean? It means sidewalks, it means benches, it means kind of street furniture and walkways provided along the frontage of all the parcels. So what, whereas now you see a, a big, large, large setback and not a lot going on in front of the buildings, there'll be more of a pedestrian oriented space. The zoning requires also a minimum 15% of the developable lot area. So developable lot area means taking away the constraints that Amanda just went over. So not the wetlands, um, not the flood zone buffer, and that will be devoted to outdoor amenity space. So that would include courtyards, street uh, side or rooftop terraces, habitat, natural space, plazas, that kind of thing. Some of these will be obviously more oriented to the employees, but they will be visually accessible. You'll be able to see them and appreciate them and they'll be more of a, an active place. And the zoning requires that projects incorporate accessible sidewalks, sky bridges, pathways to establish a sense of a walkable campus. campus. So it's more of an integrated place. Next slide, please. Um, that a modern aesthetic be uh, promoted, is, uh, we, we heard a lot, as opposed, say, to the historic town center. And, and this, people felt like natural lighting, clean lines and color be part of that modern aesthetic and more condensed parking so that you don't have that visual impact of the sea of parking. So how will this be achieved? The zoning requires that projects with multiple structures incorporate varied heights, bulk scales and sizes so that it's not just one massive building, that it has more interest. And, it's, and, and the design guidelines also help to guide that so that it's visually appealing. The zoning requires that the first floor of facades incorporate varied fenestration, that means window treatment, to ensure that the design promotes activity and decreases the building scale at the pedestrian level. So in other words, if you're walking along the building, you can see inside it and it is, and you're seeing activity and, and the building itself has bump outs, sitting areas, eating areas, entrances, so that it's not just one flat facade. The zoning also strongly encourages structured parking and that that be located either to the side or the rear of the property so that that reduces that visual impact of the sea of parking. Zoning also requires that the first floor of parking structures facing public rights of way designed so that they're also active uses so that it's not parking at the first level, you can see a conference area, a fitness center, again, more interesting to a pedestrian passing. Next slide, please, or a bicyclist, by the way. Next slide, please. So uh, decreasing emissions produced by buildings and maximizing non-car transportation options were also highly prioritized and valued by participants in this process. So how will this be achieved? So site plan review will include applying sustainability principles of and you know, state of the art sustainability principles. Zoning, the zoning itself encourages buildings to be designed to meet certification requirements that are again of a sustainability lead uh, standard. And the permitting process will require a parking and transportation management plan in order to obtain approval. In other words, um, a company must submit a plan about how they're going to manage the additional um, trips that they will generate by their employees coming and what they will do to mitigate that impact. And it will encourage, um, the zoning itself will encourage an increase in the transportation mode shift options, meaning that it will encourage companies to find ways to encourage their employees to use something other than the car to get to work and home again. So shifting from that single vehicle occupancy to the bicycle, to transit, et cetera. Next slide, please. And uh, participants were interested in visible sustainability so that it's almost like an expression of 
um, the desire to be resilient, the desire to be caring to the environment. Um, in examples where that they could see solar energy panels, recycling being evident, and prioritizing native species in green spaces. So how will we achieve this? Uh, the site plan review will apply sustainability principles, including the use of renewable energy sources, namely solar, and that zoning will require that roofs be designed to incorporate green or blue roofs, solar or alternative energy, and that mature trees be preserved and that street trees are installed every 20 to 30 feet and all trees that are removed that are six inches in diameter or more, they need to be replaced. It is required that they are replaced. Next slide, please. So people were very concerned about the uh, traffic impacts and uh, for a number of reasons for congestion, but also um, impacts on the environment in terms of emissions, et cetera. So reducing the number of single occupancy vehicle trips is important to uh, residents for access to transit and safer access to the Minuteman bikeway, which was seen as a way of promoting more bicycle trips. So that if people can come on the bikeway, then feel that they can safely connect to the properties, um, that they would be more likely to do so. So how will we achieve this? The zoning will require electronic vehicle charging stations for a minimum of 10% of the total parking spaces. The zoning requires that, that outdoor amenity space include passageways for pedestrians and bicycles that are safe and pleasant. And the zoning requires that the pedestrian amenity space establish a transition from the public street, streetscape onto the property. In other words, again, providing a, a dedicated space to pedestrians and bicyclists that is safe and pleasant and that connects. And permitting will require a trip reduction plan in order to obtain approval and include mode shift goals as ways of achieving these as discussed um, just moments ago. Next slide, please. Amanda, would you like to um, explain the process, please? Yeah, so this is a pro um, slide that we had shown previously back in like September. Um, so this really goes through the previous slides that I had discussed, but this is just to recap on those. So what we're really looking at, everything in the solid uh, orange, yellow um, square, that is everything that we're working on for the annual town meeting, and that have really kind of we're at that final phase of that. Um, the draft bylaws release, we're releasing today. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a lot of public engagement, which we have done through various sessions, but we will continue to do that. Even though the public engagement sessions for more information collecting to help develop these bylaws and the design guidelines and the um, various amendments is coming to a close on, I think it's December or January 21st, we still have to go through the planning board public hearing process, which is going to start on February 4th. So we do still have quite a bit to go before we kind of finish this project out. And then it does require to go to town meeting. Also, the development of the database was something that we had put together at the beginning, just so we better understand what these parcels look like, what can take place there, and how these parcels can be further developed. It also helped educate us. So when we're talking to landowners or developers or potential um, opportunities, we know where we can direct various businesses. We can be better educated about the parcels of land. The next pillar is shown in a dashed square. This is post town meeting, but yet still worked on at the same exact time. Because the design guidelines are approved by the planning board and incorporated into the planning board regulations, they don't go to town meeting. However, they are essential for the zoning bylaw to make sure that it is pretty much as we envisioned it. So they are going to be moving forward together. Um, the design guidelines will be released within the next few weeks, and then that'll go through a planning board review process as well. Um, we also are working on as a staff level to develop a site plan review process for this application to make sure that it is one doable, 
but two, getting everything that the staff needs. So that would include conservation, planning, uh, zoning board, um, building department, uh, sustainability, board of health, et cetera, to make sure that these projects are reviewed comprehensively, efficiently, but also that we get the information so we can let the public review it as well so it's a transparent process. Then in the last pillar, you'll see that's slated for March of 2022. That's actually when we would look at housing and then also collaboration with a special permit residential development or SPRD um, who is currently working on updating the special permit for residential projects. Um, so this is really kind of what we were building off of when we've been moving through this since September. Um, next slide. So we have a couple of questions for you and then we'd like to open it up uh, for questions for us. So next slide, please. So if you could tell us what you like best about what the draft zoning for the Hartwell Innovation Park intends to achieve, what do you like best? And you could uh, just add that in the chat if you would. Sustainability, walkability, coherence. Anything else? Incorporation of the range of constraints, pedestrians, native planting. I like the fact that folks can bike to work, pedestrian friendly area, sustainability and people focus. So there seems to be a lot of consensus about what people like, environmental concern, people focus. So really it seems like it's three things. It's that people focus, the concern for the environment and that sense of place. Um, proposal ignores the reality that the street is effectively 250 feet wide. Unless that's changed, the street will always promote excessive speed, um, but there are plans to uh, calm that traffic. Interesting and very design, pedestrian spaces, sustainability. So next slide, please. Oh, and that people will want to work there. So attracting people to work there. Is there anything that concerns you about the draft zoning? And of course, we know you haven't been able to see it in great detail, but just from what we've said tonight and from what you know of it, anything that concerns you? I saw someone um, earlier say, um, you know, how confident are we that if it's rezoned, the, developer, the developers will come? Um, the fact of the matter is, and um, Sandia can probably speak to this in terms of the market feasibility, um, there seems to be a lot of demand for such space um, and contemporary space, even in this time of, well, one could say economic crisis. I don't know, Sandia, if you'd like to say anything more about that. Oh, but we can't hear you, right? I hope you can hear me. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so, um, so yes, the market feasibility is high. Uh, in fact, we've been talking to most of the um, current uh, property owners and uh, some of them have shown real interest in taking the opportunity of the zone that zoning that was passed as Article 16 this fall um, and are looking forward to, um, to some of the, um, the standards and the design guidelines and the zoning that the staff is proposing so that they can take um, take the project to the next level. Um, so we are working very closely with most of the property owners so that we can have the sustainability standards, the um, also uh, the constraints that Amanda has been uh, mentioning as well as the transportation mitigation efforts that the staff really wants to see out there um, incorporated in any development that happens on Hartwell in the future. I do see some of the uh, Ability to reduce car dependency is a concern. Yeah, um, I, and that's something that we are trying to address in the zoning bylaw um, under the transportation mitigation. Someone has also said we have one project ready to go already. 
Um, a question about any restrictions on restaurants. Who wants to answer that? No, Amanda, no restrictions. No restrictions on restaurants. And we did, um, so just so everyone knows, we did expand it, uh, some of the uses to make sure that they were catching the newer uses, basically updating the table of uses. Um, and that, that would allow for brew pubs slash brewery pubs, um, which is a very big thing in different communities. Um, we've also allowed for distilleries, cidery, um, brewery, etc. cetera, um, in the table of uses. So that is a new line item that people will see um, when they are reviewing that table of uses. And, and like you said, Amanda, it's a, it's a new in thing for communities. And so we'll be competing that way too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, so Sheila, would you like to answer that? How will separated bike lanes be carried throughout the entire zone? Oh, maybe she's not able to. Oh. No, I'm here. Um, so how will separated bike lanes be carried throughout the entire zone? So the separated bike lanes is 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 a separate project at the moment because that falls under the major reconstruction project that we expect in about 2030. However, the design um, has started. We'll, we're we're finalizing um, the consultant contract. So the the hope uh, we understand that there's a huge interest in having. Um, yeah, multimodal paths or separated bike lanes and regular bike lanes on this roadway. So the hope is that we have a hundred foot right of way along Hartwell. So the hope is that we can fit all of the wants and desires and needs in, in, in the current right of way. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so Amanda, someone is concerned about the 60 day process. Does it put the town in a corner to approve quickly what if the application does not meet our standards? I do believe you, you said something about that. Yeah, so if they submit documentation that's not complete or does not meet what the zoning bylaw or the zoning regulations require, then the project is put on hold. Um, it is at the responsibility of the developer to provide us what we're asking. That's why we wanna make sure that the regulations, the bylaw, and also the application is written very clearly as a checklist format so people can understand exactly what they have to submit. They also, at the time of that pre-application, is when they would have an opportunity to ask for clarification or anything about the various designs, but we would also be having a two-way conversation. In that as well, just because they have a pre-application meeting doesn't mean that we don't talk with them between the pre-application meeting and the application submittal. At any time, the developer or applicant can call and ask for clarification for questions. So by the time they get from that pre-application to the application phase, that project should be as close to ready to be reviewed and approved as it possibly can be. Um, so 60 days, although it seems quick, it's it is actually not that quick. Um, and, and it's as long as they have all the proper documentation. Correct, yeah. Because so, they won't get to the review committees until they get everything that staff needs. So uh, there are a couple of questions that are, well, actually three questions here are related. So one is uh, most of the parcels could not be built on today with modern wetland regulations. There needs to be extra concern taken. And then the other two related questions are, why are there only 25 feet wetland buffers shown when the Conservation Commission requires a 100 foot buffer? And how does the project review process for the planning board fit with the Conservation Commission review process? So in other words, um, the, the wet the concern about the wetlands and the buffer 25 versus 100 feet how does the planning board review fit with conservation commission review and a statement that most of the the parcels could not be built on today because of modern wetland regulations and that we need to be sure to take care uh yep so none of the items in the zoning bylaw would override the wetlands protection act or what is in the wetlands bylaw. Um, so everything that is currently regulated 
for wetlands today will be continue to be regulated um, in terms of the review process with the planning board. So we, the development review team includes uh, the conservation director. Um, and so what would happen is, is we would want to make sure that that there's a collaboration from that time of that pre application uh, meeting all the way through, um, which doesn't mean that the developer couldn't go to the Conservation Commission first to get their reviews and then come to the planning board, um, but we would be working together. Similar to like 91 Hartwell, um, there was a lot of good things that came out of that project, although it was a longer review process than I think people would have liked. It allowed for the planning board and the Conservation Commission to meet and actually discuss what was happening to make sure that both teams were getting what they needed to before the project was approved. Um, so we would like to see that collaboration actually happen prior to the actual submittal moving forward. Um, and then in terms of the 25 foot only being shown, we can increase because we are conscious that there are other buffers. It was just that one was the absolute no build, but we can add in the other buffers as well. That's very easy to do. And this is also related to the wetlands. What precautions will deter dumping from the back of buildings into the wetlands? For example, will there be any security cameras or other deterrents? So security cameras are an item that you can put in as part of the review process. Um, and they may be something we would add into the design guidelines. The one thing that we do know is that when dumpsters or trash facilities don't have enclosures, they just kind of go free fall for all. So as part of the design standards, and I think in the bylaw, there is a requirement that trash facilities have a pretty much a fenced in area around them with a locking door so they can open and close it. So when it is in use, it can open and it can close, but that will help prevent some of the dumping because they won't be, have access to it. The other one is uh, lighting would need to be taken care of as well for this. So there's a lot of different things um, and you would hope with the increase in pedestrian activity that increases the number of eyes around the site that would help to tour that as well. Um, and someone else is concerned about sustainability and that it should be required within the premises, so within the district, the, the, the um, Hartwell Innovation Park, and that it should, should not allow the purchase of biofuel and green electricity to offset inefficient buildings. So I don't know whether they're meaning that they'd be done off site. I'm not sure exactly. So should not allow the purchase of biofuel and green electricity to offset inefficient buildings. So Stella, the bylaw that we, oh yeah, Stella could answer that or she's there. Can you hear me? Now we can. Sorry about that. Um, I think what the question is talking about is like, instead of making their building efficient, they could use credits and use that mm. as a way to show that they've done some things sustainability. And I think that the way that the bylaw and standards are written, it wouldn't allow for that type of sort of trade trade off system. So um, we similarly don't want that type of uh, situation to occur. Very good. Um, ability to reduce car dependency is a concern. So we did have a whole session on that. Um, we talked about different ways that different, that other municipalities and other districts have worked on that. And it does take uh, planning and effort and um, that will be part of the permitting process and standards will be um, set that will require the developers uh, to adhere to certain standards in order to do that, in order to reduce the car dependency. Sheila, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think I'm, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, on a slide about reducing the use of on-site combustion, it did not indicate that all the buildings over six stories require that the building use electricity for HVAC, which was part of Article 16. Is that still a part of these zoning bylaws? 
Amanda is nodding yes. Yeah. So everything that was approved underneath Article 16, uh, when you see the draft bylaw, you'll see that there is uh, wording in blue, and that is new language being included into the existing text that's today. And then there's gray italics. Everything in gray italics is everything that was approved underneath Article 16. So we incorporated all of that language within the bylaw. So that is in there. So um, there's a gentleman who is interested in reaching Norway's goals of hitting 50% electric of new car sales um, and hoping that we won't be far behind and wondering whether 10% for electric parking is enough. So, Sheila? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I wonder the same thing. I was just looking at the clean energy, clean climate report um, to achieve a 45% reduction in our emissions. Um, so I think that is something we should consider upping, upping that number and also asking them to hold parking spaces um, uh, to be, you know, that they're, they're EV ready as well. I, I, I think that is a good point because if I have, I don't know. Yeah, we should be to the future. You're, you're on mute, Sheila. Uh, yeah, we need to do, we need to take steps if we're gonna hit that number for 2030. And that is something that you'll see um, there's in the bylaw that's drafted, there's the bylaw that's specific to the Hartwell, but also a section at the very end of um, different items that we'd be including for all projects within the community. Um, and that is one of them that we were looking at for all projects. So um, here's a, a kind of scenario question. If the airbase were to be closed, I'm Hanscom, I'm assuming. What would be the effect on the type and size of development that could occur? Um, I'm wondering whether they mean then the flyover zone is, that, that constraint is removed. I, I'm not sure if that's what they mean. If the airbase were to be closed, what would be the effect on the type and size of development that could occur? My... Well, no, you, you can go. No, you can go. Now you're unmuted. You're muted. If the air base closes, I mean, that to some degree <laughs> solves a lot of our traffic issues um, because, you know, as go, people getting through the gate is, is part of the backup. Um, it would certainly open room maybe for Lincoln Labs to expand. Um, which would then keep the interest, uh, Sandy could probably talk about more of this, but that, that's sort of the, the anchor for a lot of the, the a lot of this, um, you know, bio lab manufacturing. I would say too, that in terms of the navigation easement, the majority of air traffic is coming from Massport, not Hanscom Air Force Base. So you'd have to consider that as well for the navigation. Thanks, Casey. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. So any thought to relocate the power lines? Amanda. Uh, we haven't heard anything about any consideration to relocate those power lines. Um, that wouldn't be something that the town would be initiating. It would be something that the energy sources, but it seems highly unlikely that those would be relocated um, at our current, you know, energy uses. So that wouldn't be something that would be expected. Yeah, I, I'm sort of laughing because I mean, we can't even get rid of double poles. You can't imagine moving the power lines. Um, there is a concern. Um, someone would like to see the um, the aviation constraint again and how that affects the height of buildings. And if the heights given are above sea level. There it is, yeah. Uh, 
so the heights given, yeah, are their elevation. So they're from sea level. So yes, we would subtract then the elevation of the land to get the maximum height. Um, and so the green is the aviation easement, correct? The green lines. And those are the lines that affect the heights. Yes, those are the lines that affect the, the heights. And then the, the shaded area on sort of the outside is a, is a single height. It doesn't get increased. There's sort of this cone of increasing height as you go off the end of the runway. Um, unclear what encouragement means with respect to implementation of the values. Is this economic incentives for businesses to follow? I'm not sure what they're referring to there. Um, maybe when we said that some of the objectives will be achieved by encouraging. So that's sometimes part of the discussion with the developer and yes, it can be a kind of a back and forth about permitting and um, providing oh. incentives. Can I chime in? Please. Um, so, so the encouragement uh, used in most of the um, language here does not mean that we'll be um, negotiating the terms as incentives um, that we do generally like a TIF or uh, that tax increment financing or any other increment financing. It's more um, of values that will be added um, if they are values that we hold them towards when they actually develop on hardware. And those are some values that we look forward to in any of the development that happens in the future. Um, so the encouragement word is used in that context. Thank you, Sandhya. Uh, need to make sure that walkability includes connections to trails in the broader community, not just loops around the, the, the um, Hartwell Innovation Park. And yes, that is definitely part of the plan and of the zoning. 10% of parking to have charging stations is high and very costly, but can we price out and see how it looks? Well, that is the plan to, to do that. Sustainability should be required within the premise, should not allow, oh, we did that one already, sorry. What is the use table unchanged from CM? So the table of uses um, is actually changed. Um, so in ter terms of what is and it's not allowed, uh, the, C the CHP or the HIP, Hartwell Innovation Park has a new column all the way down. And so those, we looked at each use individually in terms of the use and the vision that we had for Hartwell and determined if it was a yes, which is allowed by right, if it was a R, which is required site plan review, which basically all projects within the Hartwell Innovation Park require site plan review, or if it was a no, which means it's prohibited. Um, so we went down through all of the uses and made that determination. There was a team of us as building, uh, building, zoning, um, and then everyone that you see here today that went through that. Um, so there are, it is different than the CM. And that will be available to, for, for viewing and reviewing uh, on, the, on the website, correct? It is already on the website. It's already there. Yes. So will the new zoning include wet lab space? Yes, it, it has an actual a line item. Uh, there's light manufacturing associated with research and development. There's wet manufacturing or research and development. And then there is pilot wet manufacturing. Um, and then we have a couple other additional uses and we gave different examples of those various uses within that as well. It's all in section N of the table of uses. This woman knows her table of uses by heart. Um, wet lab is, would necessarily have to be there because part of the reason that people are coming to Lexington is to get more lab space that's more expensive to have in Kendall Square 
So they want to come here and spread out. And if we're going to be competing with Burlington and Bedford and Waltham, it wouldn't have to necessarily be. So regarding the town review, conservation review needs time also. That's recognized. Eversource has programs to help with infrastructure costs for EV charging. So that's to connect with, with Eversource. Mm. Um, there's a, 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 the same person concerned again about the vehicle speeds. Um, in the Complete Streets project, there, there is a plan for traffic calming, correct, Sheila? She's nodding vigorously. Yes, yes. I also um, would like to note that with this concept, there's a couple impediments, uh, irrespective of whether having two one-way paths would slow traffic. This would be very, uh, very expensive for the town to try to get the rights to the property to do the land swaps to provide what is currently travel way in, in the town right of way to give that to the property owners so that they would give us the, the land in, on, in their front yards. That would be very expensive, very time consuming. And it also would break up the parcels just when we're trying to get, encourage the property owners to assemble the, the parcels to build, to build more. So it's, it's one, very expensive, two, I, don't, I think it would um, defeat a couple of the objectives that um, we have with the new zoning. And Carol, you're responding to the proposal that this gentleman makes that there be a reconfiguration of the street between McGuire and Westview and that it be, there be in that in wide intermediate space, correct? That's right. See, can Amanda explain again why buildings under the new bylaw will not have bigger footprint? So, no, the building may have a bigger footprint. Um, it's more of increase in impervious area. So that includes the parking lots, uh, which we would not expect. Um, we may see more development along the property frontages because there are large setbacks that have been significantly reduced. But in terms of the backs of a lot of these parcels, there are a lot of constraints as shown in the constraints map, which include the high tension wires, the wetlands, but also the floodplains that go right through this area. So it's more of not seeing expanded impervious area, not building footprints. The other item that we are strongly encouraging is structured parking because if we can reduce the amount of surface parking and encourage structured parking, but also within that structured parking, allowing the first floor facing a, build, or a, a roadway or the upper floors to be flex space or easily convertible to retail or fitness areas or other types of uses if the parking demand ever decreases or if transportation kind of shifts in a different direction where not everybody's needing to drive every day. Um, we did this for a project, uh, 1050 Waltham Street, the upper two floors um, have fitness areas such as basketball courts or tennis courts, but then maybe in the winter time where they do need more parking because people aren't using the bikeway or using alternate modes of transportation, they can use that for parking. So someone would like to see the timeline slide again which is up above, I think the three pillars, right? Wasn't that? No, it's not this one. Uh, I think it's the, uh, this, this one? Yep, yep. This one. That's what they want to see? I don't know. <laughs> I, I thought they the comment time. came right after this one. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, so you noticed it. So it's the review process, the 60 day review process. That as Amanda explained, as long as every, everything was in order, there could be this kind of streamlined permitting process. Um, 
A gentleman is asking if we have a comparison of the present square footage and tax revenue when it's fully built out based on space. Um, I think that you had started to work on that, but that's still in process, correct, Amanda? Um, and um, a, a woman would like to know the exact height from the land as opposed to from sea level of the buildings. Well, we, we would need to know that we would need to work out the elevations in order to do that. And they'd be slightly different in different locations, I imagine. And then as Sheila was um, pointing out the cone, right? That it's not all the same. But that can be shown uh, later on. Um, should be zero net carbon within the district, within the park. Stella, would you like to respond to that? Sorry about that, one second. So Wait, the, where's... the comment is that, the, that within the, the Hartwell Innovation Park, um, there should be a zero net carbon, that that should be the goal. So within the area, because of the <clears throat> goal to have lab buildings, it'll be challenging to uh, prohibit a goal like that because there will still need to be the ability to um, have jet backup generators and certain equipment powered, um, not entirely by electric buildings. So that's why we're framing the, the goals for the buildings to allow for wherever possible for it to be all electric, but recognizing that uh, at this point, the technology isn't necessarily there yet for some of the types of development which we're seeking in this re um, area in town. So here is more interest in following in the foots of, footsteps of Norway. Um, and gentleman is pointing out that Governor Baker just announced that there, were no, there will be no more gas car sales by 2035. So in other words, provide for more electric uh, charging stations. So as Sheila said, maybe that's something to consider revising and increasing. Daphne, I think we're gonna start promoting people um, so we can have a more natural question and answer. I'll start Thanks, bringing Casey. everyone up to a panelist. Yeah. While you're doing that, uh, maybe when would the new draft be available? It's available now online. I think they mean the revised version. Oh, okay. So when will that be available? So I have a draft which is as latest as of Monday. Um, but we, after this meeting, I probably will have more comments come in uh, from the public. In fact, I do have a couple of emails come in as well on the uh, draft. Well, also we'll incorporate what we can and uh, we'll be um, updating it as and when we start getting new, new comments. Um, so the final uh, final draft uh, should be there on January 21st, but I, I keep updating as and when uh, there are comments that that uh, the public have been making and we've been adding to it. So as Casey said, much more natural conversation now. Can I ask a follow-up question? Of course. Yes, I'm the one who asked about the zero net carbon. And zero net carbon, I meant um, uh, just within the premise, meaning that uh, the previous comment about not purchasing green uh, green biofuel or green electricity, which is only marginally more expensive than regular fuel or electricity. If you can keep zero net carbon within the premise, I mean, backup generator, I can understand that that, does, that actually is not used very often, so it really does not matter. But if you can keep the zero net carbon in normal operating conditions so that uh, you can meet the uh, uh, zero net carbon without having to purchase 
extra energy or fuel, I, mean, I think that would be great. Um, I do believe that's what Stella said, right, Stella? Yes, thank you for that comment. Uh, we're definitely aiming, you know, the town has net zero emission goals overall. So we're being considerate of that as we're developing this, but there is also only so much that we can require at this stage, um, given, you know, the building code and other uh, certain restrictions that we have as far as what we can um, make happen in the area. I did see some of the hands raised, so. Um, yeah, I saw them too. Okay. Um, Actually, um, let me respond to just uh, in that comment is that it would only require uh, efficient insulation and efficient um, the heating system uh, and the uh, <clears throat> and it, it doesn't have to be building doesn't have to be that different. You just have to put enough solar and other natural energy uh, generations and storage systems to meet the goal. Uh, I don't think it would require technology that doesn't exist yet. Thank you for that. We're, we're developing right now um, a sort of Lexington LEED certification uh, checklist, which will incorporate things such as renewable energy on site, um, the highest standard of insulation, you know, better building practices. Um, but if this is something that you have specific suggestions for, um, I'll put my email in the chat and uh, please feel free to reach out um, with those so that we can make sure that, um, you know, your comments sound to be in line with the direction we're going in right now, but I'm happy to continue the conversation if you have other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, uh, I see your hand raised. Thank you. You're calling on me, Tom Shaipo? Uh, please sure. go ahead. Uh, actually, I was calling on Charles Honey, but yes, Sorry. please. Charles, go ahead. Charles. If you're waiting for Charles, Tom, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I just wanted to ask the question that I posed in the chat regarding the 20,000 square foot lot sizes. Most of the parcels there right now are very large, like three to eight acres. And I'm just wondering, what is the process for creating these 20,000 square foot lots? Is that a formal subdivision or and is it allowed by right? And like if a property owner of a large parcel wants to cleave off 20,000 square feet for a restaurant, do they have to create a lot for that? A 20, you know, a formal lot, how does all that work? Amanda, do you want to take that? Can you repeat that? Um, the 20,000 square foot lots, how are those created out of the large three to eight acre parcel lots? So they don't actually have to, um, they can build as it is today. Um, the only way that they would actually need to go lower is if someone were to subdivide them through like an approval not required process. Um, but there were some existing parcels that um, are a lot smaller than three acres, um, such as the location where the vet is, that's not three acres. Um, so now they are conforming. Um, previously they were non-conforming. So it just allows for previous existing non-conforming parcels due to lot size to be conforming, but it allows for developers or landowners to divide parcels or merge parcels. Okay, just the example of creating a restaurant on the corner of an existing large lot, would that have to be formally subdivided or could a developer have multiple buildings with multiple uses all in the same parcel? That's what's strongly encouraged is actually having multiple buildings on one parcel. Um, so it would be allowed. Um, they'd okay. probably just need site plan review. Okay, thank you. Got my microphone fixed now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanted to answer a question that was asked earlier. The average elevation in the flat parts of Hartwell Avenue is around 130 feet. Uh, the, if you will overlay the, the navigation easement over that, 
Uh, there are places in the Hartwell district where the maximum height would be zero. There are places where the maximum height would be 150 feet just because of navigation. So it varies all over the place uh, within that cone, depending on how close to the runway you are and whether you're on one of the hills. And Thank I can you. answer it for any particular lot if you want, because I looked into all of this, but <laughs> that's the basic answer is that it varies a lot. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, my name's Darren, I've had my hand up for a bit. Uh, I was I just seeing that. I was just okay. seeing that, Darren, go ahead. Thank you. So um, in the maps on the early slides, I noticed that, and you pointed this out as well, that the, um, the lot that's 459 through 475 Bedford Street, uh, on the other side of Bedford Street, had, it was in an orange boundary as opposed to the yellow boundary of the rest of the uh, project. And I wanted uh, a little bit of explanation on how its, how its status is different um, or not different and why, what, what that demarcation indicates. Yeah. Uh, so the big differences between uh, what is in yellow and what is in the orange color is that what's in yellow was actually the area that was approved or put into the CM district for the creation of the Hartwell Innovation Park. Um, so that is why the items in the yellow were just transferring them from the CM to the HIP or the CHP. But the parcel that is 454 75 Bedford Street and also the Armory. So 475 Bedford Street was part of the annual town meeting or special town meeting article 17, which actually did not pass to become part of the Hartwell Innovation Park. Um, so we are looking at that as a different type of zoning because it is commercial today and it doesn't really fit in with the single family zoning district that it's already, that's what it's currently zoned as. But we know that it needs to be unique we know that it needs to be different than the Hartwell, but we also know that it's a transition between single family homes and also the what is envisioned for the Hartwell Innovation Park. So that is what we're looking at. So it cannot go back to town meeting as part of the Hartwell, but it can go forward if it is completely different. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rick DeAngelis has had his, his hand up for a while. Uh, you're on mute, sir. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, I wear a couple of hats. I'm a Lexington resident for 45 odd years. Uh, I am a member of EDAC, Economic Development Advisory Committee, along with uh, George Brunel, who's face I saw around here earlier, and I happen to be counsel at Boston Properties, a landowner and developer in and around Lexington and elsewhere. And I have, I have a couple of quick questions. One, is your slide presentation available to be uh, emailed to those who would like to uh, have it to uh, use as a reference tool for the moment? It will also be posted on the website. Okay, thank you. And Two, uh, and more to the point, um, I think that uh, this is a great first step uh, beyond Charles Hornig's uh, Article 16, which passed at the special town meeting. Um, like anything, uh, it's an ambitious project. Uh, there are pulls and tugs, and there's a lot of language uh, and that has to be reviewed with a fine tooth comb. Uh, have, being a lawyer that I am, I read these things uh, for particular meaning. And uh, I think that uh, you, will, you will have a set of comments from me and uh, Boston Properties uh, on Monday, uh, dealing with uh, consistencies and inconsistencies and things like that. Not meant to be criticism. It's just, I think you've done a really good job trying to assimilate uh, and put things together. Uh, but um, nonetheless, uh, anybody who takes the time to read it will, will find that they'll, they'll have questions at least and certainly possibly comments as well. Thank you for that. And I'm sure your comments will be very helpful. Given your many hats, I'm actually trying to imagine the pegs on your wall. But um, 
Thank you. Because all those hats will be useful. Any other hand is in, oh, Keith Ochmart. Uh, yes, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm a Lexington resident and chair of the Greenways Quarter Committee. And I was very pleased to see our trail signs for the Across Lexington Trails as part of your slide presentation. And my question is whether your committee has is aware of or consulted the 2011 West Lexington Greenway Master Plan, which involves trail planning throughout from north to south on the west side of 128 that goes right through the Hartwell district and what opportunities there might be to tie in to what you're doing with that project. I actually saw that in the chat and that's a very um, good point. I don't know uh, to date what has been done with that, but which it should definitely be part of the process moving forward. Does anyone know if that has been incorporated in the, the planning or if it just, make sure to do so moving forward. Yeah, no, we know about it, but I, I think it's, I think that's a great suggestion, Keith, to give that another look. In fact, we were talking about it in regards to the 25% design as well. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's a good idea. So thank you. Um, any other hands? Let's see. Anybody see? Anyone else have a question or a comment? Um, anything that you feel you need more information about? I received a, um, I see, actually I was just about to read your uh, email, Janet, but Janet has her hand raised. So uh, if you can unmute yourself. Real quickly, will there be any pedestrian crossing over Bedford Street in the district? I didn't see that in the planning maps. No, well, so that's to be determined because that's, because this is zoning and so that falls into the 20, the major reconstruction project. Um, So it's not a no, but it's not a yes, right? It's that that's still in the planning. So we'll take that note that is, is and um, is that meaning that that's something you would desire to incorporate a pedestrian crossing? If we don't want people to drive to work, um, they have to live somewhere and presumably it could encourage people to live on the other side of uh, Bedford Street where there's housing. So we have a new Hawk, um, you know, an activated red light crossing at Bedford. Um, hopefully people are using that because I know people were just darting across. Um, and so that, that's actually been a, a significant improvement in the last year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then I received some comments earlier today. Um, I just wanted to address that uh, here as well. Um, someone had emailed me asking um, about an explanation for footnote that has been added uh, to what was approved uh, by town meeting in October in so many places. It allows the planning board to approve something outside of the specs that are in the bylaw of any of the lines in which it appears and that's not made, uh, that was not made clear. Please outline the process in such, uh, of such expectations, why that are envisioned as necessary, for example, building heights and number of stories. Um, so I have emailed Amanda uh, most of these comments, but I just wanted to address that during the session, um, just in case we, we want to get that clarification. I think most of the, uh, and this is from my perspective, it's uh, most of the uh, footnotes and most of the definitions that we have right now is, is to explain the bylaw as clearly as possible. And there were, there were additional questions about, you know, some of the, um, some of the terminologies that have been used. So we'll be having a glossary section, I think which will explain most, um, most of the jargons that, that have been used in that. Um, and uh, so that's my understanding, but uh, 
Uh, Andrea, what what about the footnote? It was of concern, and and what did you say the footnote was intended to do to explain further? So I am really not sure what the question is all about, but uh, the last example that she's given, please outline the process for such expectation uh, exceptions and why there were in, uh, they were envisioned as necessary. For example, for building heights and number of stories. I don't. I don't know what, what the exceptions were, but uh, I just wanted to put this question in the recording so that you know, we address that question. But I definitely will email or um, call this person and have a chat about- um, To understand further what they mean, yeah. There's Any a question stuff? from Nancy Sofen. Oh, thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm a member of the tree committee and I'm pleased that there is a provision in the bylaw for replanting of trees that have been removed, but on a parcel where there is not space to replant all trees, have you considered any mechanism where those trees could be planted on other parcels in the innovation area um, that have more open space? Hmm. That's an interesting point. Uh, that's not specified in the zoning now. We were allowing for um, it to fall under, I think it was uh, section 120-8C, which would be allowing them to provide mitigation for those trees. But then also um, there is some work on it, on the same initiative by uh, the Sustainable Landscape Committee as well, who was looking, has yep. a guidance in that would allow for that mitigation of the replacements. Yes, they do it we, we are working, we are working on that, but I was just wondering if you had considered that and if it's even, you know, um, possible to do that given that they're all private parcels. Yeah, we would be looking at actually okay. doing something exactly like that. Okay, but thank you. I'm not sure exactly where they would go. Yeah. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Let's see. To scroll through the screen to see you all. Oh, hi, uh, this is Lynn Jensen. Can I ask a question? Please. Oh, hi. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, the current uh, or the last uh, bylaw uh, language I saw has this, a lot of places where uh, they, it's written to the extent like, oh, you do this, but to the extent possible or maximize and so in a way that it kind of leaves uh, the decision uh, to the builder or to the developer some of the decisions on sustainability so um, I just wondered what kind of uh, when you have suggestions like that uh, how would uh, our town uh, enforce that um, and also if we are under the 60 day uh, pressure and the developer came in saying, oh, we, we have already done our best. This is the best we can do. Um, so do, so how do we, I don't know how the mechanisms of push and pull, uh, push and pull we would have to make sure we get the maximum. So I, I personally, I would think maybe it's wise to uh, not have too many uh, places to mention uh, to the best of your ability or um, as much uh, feasible or economically or practically feasible. We just say this is what we want, but uh, of course everything is up to variance and uh, other considerations. Um, so that actually was a previous edition. The edition that was released today actually does not have those to the greatest extent feasible. I was just reading how, you know, it's, it has a lot of shall be. Yeah. Everything is shall or must. Or must. Oh, that's uh, really wonderful to hear. So when was that uh, latest version released? Is it today or yesterday? Today. <laughs> oh, perfect, okay, that's wonderful. I think it got posted this afternoon. Um, oh, okay, so I was like, did I miss something? Oh, that's great news. But I was also wondering, uh, the previous person also asked uh, when is the next versions. So I understand that maybe you would have multiple versions uh, before January 27th because uh, there are a lot of feedbacks and you're meeting with different committees and 
Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so this is a release today of a draft. So we released a draft uh, in the fall um, and we've been having public sessions and collecting a lot of information. Um, so we released a document today. And so we're hopeful that everyone has the time to review it, provide some comments or any questions or just concerns that they may have. So we would take those comments and the information that we're gathering here today as well. And um, we also have some other meetings. So we would be collecting that information, providing an update of our next release is gonna be January 21st, which would be a revised of what was released today. All right, thank you so much. And you can see uh, Sandhya sent out here, all, all information will be available on the www.hiplexington.com as well as on the economic development page, the Hartwell Rezoning Initiative. Um, here's another question. Is there anything in the bylaws or regulations for the hint that sets aside a percentage of new development for certain uses, open space, recreation? So there is a set aside for outdoor amenities and for pedestrian amenities. Don't believe there is one for recreation, um, Amanda. Uh, no, there's not one specific for rec recreation, but what we are allowing for, which is kind of what we mentioned with the, um, the ability to easily convert the first floor or the upper floors of a parking garage, um, that would be a requirement. Um, so that could be a possibility. Also, we do have, you know, we do know that there is a need for you know, multi-purpose spaces and everything like that. So that's something that when we're talking with developers, they may consider having multi-purpose spaces that they can use for their employees during the day and then maybe lease it out at night. Um, so those are things that we're looking at, um, but there isn't a, we can't require them to put in fields or other items that would be utilized by the town because that would be considered a taking but they might be um, wanting to, you know, be kind of friendly and offer its use on the weekends or. Right, the developer can offer it. It's just, we can't require it because if we require it without compensation, it's a taking. So I haven't looked, but where is today's version on the HIP website? Someone would like to know. Where is, the, where is today's version? Where is today's draft on the website? The uh, the header it says Jan, uh, it says December twenty fourth, but uh, it's it's not actually the date was not changed for the oh so it says December twenty fourth draft yeah but it's uh, it's the latest one and uh, it's as of Monday today's version has not been updated uh, uh, on the hip lexington.com the version that we have is for the Monday uh, that would be January fourth. Fourth. On the on the page next to the page number at the bottom, it does have the January fourth date. Date. Yes. Oh, it says it in the footer. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the footer, so yeah. the header needs to be changed. Yes. So maybe we can change the header after the meeting tonight. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Something you'd like to know more about? Hands. Hmm. Well, I have a question. I I was distracted at one point. Uh, did the question about uh, possibility how have a, a development in the middle of the street and then have two way streets uh, uh, answered? Uh, Carol answered that. Oh, sorry. Okay, I will listen to the recording. Yeah. Basically, she was saying that it would be quite expensive given that there were private properties that you would have to negotiate, but also instead of assembling uh, parcels, it would be disassembling parcels. So it would be going against some of the objectives of this project. Okay, thank you for repeating it. Of course.
So, what do you think? Pause in case there's. I think there was. Um, Mr. Ashok Patel was earlier saying that he wanted to, wanted to just get going on it, right? I'm trying to see his comment. He was ready to go. Saying thumbs up. He's, yeah. <laughs> You want to tell us more about your readiness? Yes, ma'am. We're trying uh, to get something designed at 440 Bedford Street, um, where the hotel is currently. Um, since Charles's effort uh, unable that side of the street to sort of go early, so we're, we 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 should have something that's visible by or shareable at least with the powers that be. Um, probably by February, so. And, and what is that something? Uh, it, it'll be a life science. So you feel encouraged by the market and supported by Lexus? Yeah, I think if there's any good, you know, the way we feel, you know, property owners, developers is, this is gonna be as any good time as there's gonna be, I think. I think if you miss this boat right now, um, you might as well miss it for the next 10 years coming, so. Because mind you, what is happening around us is Watertown, Waltham, um, Burlington, uh, obviously Cambridge, Somerville. There's probably three, four million square feet, maybe more of lab that's either in on paper now or so much of it in, in construction already. So if you talk about demand generators, you know, you can't have endless tenants, right? right? I mean, there's going to be some saturation at some point. So once all these communities, you know, go out there with, with, with the project, which is sort of much ahead of the schedule than we are, um, I feel like we may be at the tail end of it almost. I, I really don't want to waste any time, I feel like, you know, given what's happening around us. Well, it'd be nice to see your proposal. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Um, so what do you think? Anybody else? This is uh, Cindy Ayers. I just had a quick uh, clarification and maybe I missed it. So we were just having a discussion that on the HIP Lexington website right now is the 1-4 uh, um, version, but I believe Sandia mentioned another one. No, that's the latest version. If, if the one that says one four in the footnote, and unfortunately says twelve twenty four in the header, that's the latest version as of today, and after tonight, that it will be more evident. But there'll be another one coming. Amanda wants to say something. Yeah. So the one that um, we've been discussing tonight hasn't been posted. Um, so I guess that's going to be posted tonight. So that'll be dated one seven twenty twenty one. Thank you. And thanks. I just put a link um, in the chat to the one seven draft zoning. I'm working on getting it up on the HIP website now, but the one seven link is in the chat. So whoever attended the meeting gets a head start. And thank you for the thank you, Lynn and Mary. And we want to thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and your listening patiently to the presentation and your very uh, constructive ideas about how to improve the, the zoning bylaw. We'll be back. Um, should we show the last slide, Casey? So we'll be back. Um, well, Sandhya, do you want to take us through the uh, the upcoming public outreach that says out each 
but it should be outreach. So Friday, January 15th at 8 a.m. is a coffee, um, a coffee listening session. On Thursday, January 21st, we'll be presenting the revised, the, the yet one more time revised uh, zoning bylaw. And then Thursday, February 4th at 8 a.m. is another listening coffee. Then we have the uh, public hearings that will be scheduled because this process doesn't end here. It's not as though this is the end. Once we present the final draft to you, there will be a series of public hearings with the, with the planning board that have yet to be scheduled. Anything else anyone would like to say from the Lexington team? Yeah, I just updated the website. Yay, Sandhya. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We appreciate uh, the time you're, you've given this and some of you I, I know have attended a few of our sessions. So that's a lot of time commitment. We very much appreciate your input and your ideas. And there's still more chance to give it. So if you have more thoughts after tonight, be sure to forward them. Thank you. Thank you very much.